Hello, viewers. Uh, this is Dr. Karma Chima, and I'm honored and thrilled to have with me uh, Mr. Asan Bhatt, uh, who is an associate professor um, at the School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bhatt, for your time for my YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful. Thank you. So uh, the today's question is very important that the world order is changing. So while you are an academic, you are based in U.S. in Washington. Uh, how do you see uh, this changing order while sitting in Washington, and particularly while uh, you have just seen some uh, optics uh, in the in the Pacific, where we have seen the uh, U.S. Um, special uh, the Nancy Pelosi was there in Taiwan, and we have seen that the the Chinese uh, uh, militaristic designs have also come in front of us. The Chinese call that provocation. So, how do you see this? developing international order uh, first if we can have a, a short conversation on that yeah for sure i think it's a very important question in in international politics and i think a lot of a lot of academic researchers are working on the rise of china the implications of the rise of china uh, certainly it's a big topic uh, graduate students write a lot of dissertations uh, on these topics we see a lot of articles and books being published on these topics so it's certainly a hot topic uh, in our in our field, um, I think there's when we talk about the rise of China and sort of changes in international order. I think there's maybe two or three uh, sort of elements that I would break that down into. One is uh, ideational and norms, right? So so for instance, China has different views than the than the prevailing so-called liberal international order. Uh, China has different views on things like uh, human rights or humanitarian intervention on human rights. Uh, China may have different views on the trade-off between uh, respecting uh, sort of self-determination versus respecting respecting borders. So that's a trade-off, right? And in, in the international order, uh, you want to give minorities the right, or ethnic minorities or religious minorities, the right to for self-determination. But there's also inbuilt into the international order a respect for borders or a respect for sovereignty that we're not going to change borders. And so those two those two ideas are diametrically opposed. Um, so the international order has set one particular line for where that trade-off is, and maybe China wants to change where that line is on self-determination versus respect for borders. Uh, for instance, China may have much more respect for borders and much less respect for self-determination than the prevailing international order uh, has it. Um, so on, also, on, on democracy, you know, for instance, on, 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 the, on the promotion of democracy and the extent to which that should be uh, you know, a reasonable uh, or or feasible or viable goal for for world superpowers, as it has been for the last seventy years. So, certainly, ideationally, China challenges a lot of the prevailing norms and ideas of the international system. And then, if we move to away from norms and ideas to sort of brute power politics, uh, China's rise is also, in some cases, reaffirming existing alliance patterns. In some cases, is challenging existing alliance patterns. Uh, certainly in Asia, you could you could see sort of, you know, uh, I'm sure we're going to get to this, but the birth of a very strong relationship between the U.S. and India, uh, which would not be uh, possible or, or viable in a world without uh, a, a rising China, uh, for instance. Uh, you see things like the Quad, right, where the U.S. and Australia and, and Japan and India uh, are much closer today than they would have been otherwise if it weren't for the rise of China. Uh, and 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 by the same token, you see, you know, uh, challenges in 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 other parts of the world uh, that the West has gotten either used to uh, sort of having dominion over, such as the U.S. and Latin America, or the West has gotten used to uh, this sort of benign neglect, as in as in Sub-Saharan Africa. In both those types of places, China is is making more of an effort. Doesn't mean that it's De, de, certainly in Latin America, doesn't mean it's displacing or replacing the U.S. by any stretch. But certainly China challenges existing existing alliance patterns, ex, existing spheres of influence. Um, and so both when we talk about norms and ideas, as well as when we talk about power politics, such as alliances, uh, it's certainly the case that China's rise is having and will continue to have a huge, uh, huge effect on international politics. So, uh, in all that developing international order, where do you see South Asia? And particularly since you also mentioned about India. So, how do you see 
India's rise uh, in South Asia and where does this fit in um, in the international order since uh, uh, there has been a conversation in the West about uh, the illiberal democracy in India, illiberal order there. Uh, there have been questions uh, about uh, what we call that, uh, how the human rights violations are there. Uh, at the same time, we also believe that uh, uh, the West and particularly the United States, it doesn't seem that it is as uh, careful of the past. So how do you think the West is going to embrace India? So I, just in that last 10 or 15 seconds, you, your voice got cut out. If you could just repeat the last last couple of sentences. I was just saying that how do you see uh, how the how do you see the rise of India in fact basically in this world order and how do you see the the West is going to receive India? Yeah, yeah I think uh, I think I can't speak for the West in general, but certainly in Washington D.C. and in the U.S. sort of foreign policy and national security elite, uh, India seen as a very important player uh, to to counter the rise of China um, and. Uh, I mean, the relationship with, with India is not reducible to the rise of China, but certainly the rise of China has given it a big boost. Uh, if you go back even to, to the 90s and, and uh, early 2000s, when you know both uh, Bill Clinton and, and George W. Bush from diametrically opposed sort of viewpoints of, of uh, a foreign policy ideology, Clinton came from a much more sort of internationalist, uh, sort of a liberal internationalist bent, whereas 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 the Bush administration was uh, a very sort of neoconservative uh, administration uh, bent on, on, on primacy. But regardless, both saw India as a, as a very important uh, partner, uh, not just for the rise of China, but because certainly at the time it was seen as, as, as one, as a relationship enmeshed in sort of common, quote unquote, liberal values, such as democracy. Uh, obviously, as you suggested, uh, those... Uh, that aspect of the relationship has come under increasing scrutiny, certainly given India's sort of backsliding both on uh, when we talk about majoritarianism or, or Hindu nationalism, as well as uh, democratic values and liberal values, um, uh, as well as as well as trade and 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 and, and economic investment and 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 so on. Uh, India is a huge market uh, for for American companies. Uh, it's a primarily English speaking uh, country with more than a billion billion people uh, that can conceivably in a, in a more globalized work world work for American companies from India. A lot of Indian immigrants settle in the US. Uh, the Indian immigrant population is one of the most highly successful uh, ethnic groups when we talk about educational attainment, when we talk about uh, socioeconomic attainment. Uh, Indian Americans start a lot of businesses, they're very successful on Wall Street, uh, they're very successful in Silicon Valley. So there's a lot of connections between India and the US beyond China, but certainly from a geopolitical perspective, China certainly in the last, I would say, 15 years, 15 or 20 years, uh, has been the primary driver of this relationship at a, at a geopolitical level. So India is seen as a very important ally uh in in washington that's not to say the people in washington are always perfectly happy with india uh for instance uh in the recent russia crisis for the the russia ukraine war uh you've seen some some distance between uh the the dc position and the new delhi position uh but you know that happens amongst allies that, that, that it, it's it's normal to disagree with your allies on on certain things and agree with them on on other things so uh i don't think that you know, things like the Russia-Ukraine war spells doom for, for the U.S. relationship with India or anything like that. Uh, I think it had, has, uh, you know, from an IR perspective, the most solid relationship is based on a, on a common threat, right? You can forget a lot of things on when, when you have a common threat and both both Washington and New Delhi see China as a threat. So so a lot will, a lot will follow from that and a lot will be forgiven. Uh, in given given those given those concerns, so you so, mentioned you mentioned human rights issues, and I'll just close yeah. with this: uh, you 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 mentioned human rights issues, and uh, you know it's very easy to look the other way if you're Washington uh, on on human rights concerns. I mean, this is a standard sort of. There's nothing controversial about the claim that that Washington and the West in general treat human rights issues very differently in countries where uh, 
they have a geopolitical alliance versus countries where you don't have a geopolitical alliance, right? So the exact same thing that happens in Iran is cause for regime change. But if it happens in Saudi Arabia or Egypt, you know, it's not a big deal. So, so you know, I expect India to 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 not really have any any skept any significant skepticism or questions raised about its human rights record, as long as uh, it's deemed uh, a balancer in in the larger political game against China. Well, since we're talking about this question of international order, as and we're talking about human rights, this question of human rights used to be a leverage uh, with the Americans. Uh, but over the period of time, we have realized that uh, the Chinese have bounced back uh, to the Americans, for example, on this Black Lives Matter and all these movements, even, even in the US. So do you think that uh, this question of human rights won't have that much uh, a significance or it won't have it won't give much leverage to the to the America uh, when it goes uh, globally, particularly uh, when President Biden said that we are going to make Saudi Arabia as a prior state during his campaign, but he had to go to Saudi Arabia. And then if they, they speak of Chinese, the Chinese, uh, uh, they, they just uh, bounce back. So how do you see that? Do you think that this question of human rights is not going to get value over the period of time? Yeah, I think certainly. I mean, it sort of depends on on the power dynamics between between the countries. So I think, for instance, you mentioned two cases: the U.S. and China, and the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. In both cases, obviously, the U.S. has less leverage than in and then in other cases, right? Saudi Arabia is a very important country for for the U.S. as, as in terms of energy needs, in terms of lar larger geopolitical currents in the Middle East. Uh, China is obviously the the, the the world's second most powerful state. So, you know, there's a superpower rivalry there. So the U.S. only has very limited leverage with both of those countries, although it probably has a lot more leverage with Saudi Arabia than China, but uh, especially in the middle of an energy crisis, uh, Saudi Arabia's leverage goes up, uh, which we're in the midst of. So uh, I suppose I suppose my answer to your question would be the, the extent to which human rights uh, plays a role in in u.s foreign policy is first determined by the amount of the power dynamics or the power differential in general human rights is a is a cudgel that the u.s can can beat up much smaller and much weaker powers but not generally not generally larger powers and then it also depends on the domestic dispensation here in washington i mean president trump for four years was very explicit about the fact that he didn't care at all about human rights and he was he was embracing the worst human rights abusers as a almost as a matter of pride. Uh, he had this one very famous picture with with I believe the Egyptian president and the Saudi president and the Israeli. I think the Israeli prime minister was there as well. I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> it was like quite a it's like if you could pick the worst human rights abusers in the Middle East, you'd pick those guys. And they were sort of so. I mean, the point is that the domestic president, the domestic elections, and the domestic politics also also matters here. If you elect a person who doesn't care at all about human rights, then the then the, that's going to seep down through the bureaucracy. Um, so so it depends very much who's in power and then how much power the the the, the other country has to to ward off any 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 admonishments on on the score hmm. so mr but uh, over the period of time uh, what we have realized is that uh, uh, pakistan which used to depend uh, on the american uh, global designs or the american global ambition for instance during the cold war uh, pakistan went into this jihad project we raised maintains and now we we we, we even kept sustaining uh, these uh, jihadis and now we supported the Americans in this war against terrorism. And now since the Americans have left Afghanistan, it seems that all that global order, uh, which is uh, rising, Pakistan is nowhere. And Pakistan is of no value, in fact, uh, in terms of uh, when it comes to the, this uh, developing global changes. Uh, so how do you see Pakistan uh, when the Americans are thinking about Indo-Pacific? Uh, uh, largely, do you think they, they look Pakistan from the Chinese lens, or do you think that uh, uh, they value Pakistan in a different way? I certainly think if you use the term value, uh, Pakistan has very low value right now in Washington. Um, I don't think Pakistan is, so I'll answer both of your, I mean, let's answer your first question first. Is it viewed through the China lens? Not exclusively and not even primarily, I would say. Pakistan is not seen as a major uh, 
player in that larger superpower game, the way India might be, for instance, or the way the East Asian countries might be. Uh, not just Japan and South Korea, but countries like you know Vietnam, for instance. Uh, I'm not sure Pakistan is seen through the lens of, of superpower competition in China. I think Pakistan is seen primarily through the lens of, of for better or worse, for, 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 for issues like terrorism, for issues like national security, uh, cooperation on groups like Al-Qaeda, uh, but uh, nothing nothing more than that. So as for value, I think given, given the very difficult nature of, of the alliance that you spoke of, especially in the, in the so-called war on terror, uh, since 2001, um, especially, I mean, yeah, it's really been a bipartisan, it's really been a bipartisan uh, detachment. Uh, it, uh, the skepticism first started under under George W. Bush. It was turned from skepticism to outright sort of distaste, and in some cases hostility under the Obama administration, and then Trump sort of completed it with the, with, you know, some of his statements and uh, and even if you chart things like financial aid and economic aid, they've been, you know, uh, they went from billions of dollars to essentially nothing in the last 15 years. So, so certainly Pakistan is not seen as as a as a valuable ally in in Washington. Uh, it's not seen as a helpful helpful ally. Uh, we can debate <laughs> if you would like. We can debate the sort of uh, justifiability of that of that view. But either way, that is the view, and. Um, uh so no i would say that 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 pakistan is not seen as 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 a prize to be won per se as oh we have to have these guys on our side in this larger superpower game now every time there's a war in afghanistan yes you know so if you're waiting for a war in afghanistan you know every 10 or 20 years to to cement your geopolitical alliances sure but beyond that Pakistan does not have much to offer. Our economy is not well integrated into, into, into the world economy. Uh, we, uh, you know, we're not a, we're not a big economic player. We're not a big diplomatic player. Uh, so, so yeah, I think our influence and our value is pretty limited right now in in Washington. Yeah, this is what we have been. Uh talking us since long uh, that uh, if uh, Pakistan has to move on with the US that needs to be beyond the security lens uh, uh, so one last question and that is about China when um, when the Americans when the Pakistani authorities speak on the question that we cannot join any bloc uh, for instance we cannot join Chinese bloc we cannot join the uh, 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 the American bloc uh, how that uh, how do you see this assertion is viewed that uh, uh, since Pakistan wants to stay in, in both the blocks. So do you think, uh, but uh, what, what is the general perception about Pakistan is that it is in the Chinese block and it's no more in the American block. So do you think that Pakistan can keep uh, a balance in its relations between China and the US, uh, the way the Indians have kept a balance between the Americans and the Russians? Do you think that Pakistan has that leverage or at some point Pakistan will be forced to change its position or uh, Pakistan will be left with no choice? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think, I think the first way I would approach it is by thinking more at a general level, uh, because I think what 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 happened during the Cold War, when you had these two very solid blocks of of the Eastern Bloc and 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 the NATO countries uh, in the West, I think that sort of uh, solidified in people's idea in people's minds in the collective sort of minds of of analysts and observers that the superpower relations are generally like that. That generally you will have two very uh, sort of well-formed and and rigid blocks, um, and I'm not sure that the U.S.-China relationship will will necessarily replicate that. If you look at human international polit political history in 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 the, era, in the era of states or even the era of empires, it's very rare for for alliance patterns to be as rigid as they were in in the Cold War. Generally, there's a lot of shifting. Generally, there's a lot of hedging. You have, especially minor powers, generally trying to play both sides. Um, so, as a as a general matter, I think the idea of two rigid blocks may be too too overplayed in the popular imagination. And certainly, in the, in the case of East Asia today, East Asian countries themselves are are very wary of being dragged into this sort of new Cold War per se, right? So, if you look at uh, 
more minor powers in 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 east asia such as such as vietnam but even more minor than that such as singapore or malaysia uh they are all very keen to sort of not get dragged into a larger a larger conflict between the us and china uh you know as as the old saying goes when two elephants fight you know it's the grass that suffers so uh so i think pakistan can certainly hope to replicate that i don't think there's any anything structural that that per se that 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 says pakistan can't play both sides or we can't hedge i think hedging is totally plausible now whether it actually happens i think depends on who's in power in islamabad who's in power in rawalpindi how do they think about it uh but certainly in as a general matter i think hedging is a perfectly good strategy and i think more importantly both the us and china will be perfectly happy with pakistan as a as a hedger um i mean it, it it's a it can be both seen as a good thing or a bad thing right you can see it as a bad thing like oh we're not valued like uh, we're not seen as a big enough player that you have to have us on your side but by the same token it can also be a good thing because you're not being forced to take sides right the us <clears throat> the us is not so gung ho that pakistan has to be with it in this larger india yes right japan yes south korea yes but uh not necessarily pakistan pakistan by the, china by the same token doesn't want to be responsible or doesn't want to be seen as responsible as or doesn't essentially want another north korea on its hands right where it's the patron or the the sort of the guardian for a troublemaker state uh it would rather have you know pakistan take care of itself and have a more normal re- relationship a more normal give and take relationship they don't want to be responsible for bailing us out all the time like they're being asked to bail us out right now economically so uh, i think both the us and china would be perfectly happy with pakistan hedging i would be perfectly happy with pakistan hedging uh, but the question is are pakistani leaders perfectly happy with with pakistan hedging and and i think there is a natural proclivity uh certainly in rawalpindi for for to see uh the us much more skeptically than 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 china in general now one one army chief might be different from another army chief and one prime minister might be different from another prime minister but in general it seems to be the case that the us uh attracts more skepticism amongst amongst policy circles in in islamabad and pindi but you know uh so it's so like i said it sort of depends on them but i think both superpowers would be totally happy with us hedging hmm. yes obviously pakistan have to fix so many things to uh have a position uh, in international system or to be valued properly uh as pakistan wants to be valued uh, thank you very much uh, dr asan but for your time and for helping our viewers to understand uh how things are shaping globally and uh, how you view things and uh, obviously uh, this input uh, will value a lot uh, to the memory of our viewers thank you very much thank you so much for having me it was a pleasure